So my name is Ram Prasad Rao, and uh, I work for the, I'm officially employed by the ASIA project, or ASIA, which is a partner in the submillimeter array along with the Smithsonian. Uh, I'll talk about antennas and pointing, uh, try to focus a little bit more on the SMA, but there are lots of references uh, and it's all at the end. And if you need lots more information and what I'm gonna be presenting in this while, uh, take a look at those. Okay, so here's a brief outline of the, some of the things I'll be covering. I'll we'll talk about the role of an antenna, different types of antennas, and then the parabolic reflector, which is the main antenna, that uh, main antenna design that's used at these frequencies. <laughs> Uh, then a little bit about fundamentals of antennas, beam patterns, and the SMA optics, and then uh, implications on antenna pointing and holography on your data. Okay, so what's an antenna? Uh, this is the definition, official definition, at least by IEEE, of what an antenna is. And I'm just going to read it. It says, it's that part of a transmitting or receiving system which is designed to radiate or to receive electromagnetic waves. It's very simple, but there's actually a very, very key word. And that key word is actually or. And that says that you could think of the antenna, it's either receiving or transmitting. And this is a very important uh, part, and it's actually been codified into what's called the reciprocity theorem. And it says that the receive and transmit properties of an antenna are identical. So if you want to understand how we receive the signals, and that's what we do all the time in astronomy and radio astronomy, all we're doing is the receiving signals. So if you want to understand that, all we need to know is how does that antenna transmit? And so it's, it's just reciprocal. So either you can figure out one or the other. And practically speaking, the purpose of the antenna is to take the radiation that's propagating through space, all those, all those megaparsecs of a uh, distance away and through the atmosphere, which we just heard from Simon and hits the antenna. And then it's guided onto uh, and focused onto a device which is either a waveguide or a wire or anything or your receiver ultimately. And so that's what the antenna is. And I'll be talking about that. So the moment it hits the primary and then goes through a bunch of optics and reflections, et cetera, and then hits ultimately your mixer or detector or your horn and, or, or whatever the receiving element is. And so that's, that's what I'll be talking about. Okay, so here's a picture of a simple horn antenna, which looks like this. And so there are different a number of sections, and I picked this to just illustrate. So you have your source of radiation, which is here. So there's an electromagnetic wave, which we've heard a lot about, electric fields and magnetic fields. And so uh, then you have your transmission line, which could be a wave wire or a waveguide or anything. And this is the antenna part of it, which is, in this case, a horn. And so you can see that basically the signals that are propagating through, and ultimately they're launched from the mouth of the, of the waveguide into space. And that's what a simple antenna is. And we've seen all kinds of antennas. Uh, some of you, uh, most of you are probably too young to remember, but uh, <laughs> on tops of some of the older TVs, if you go to maybe an antique shop, you might find rabbit ears. Uh, some of you may have seen even walkie talkies. Like, we, they used to be common before phones, but there's still some around. If you remove that, uh, the cap, you'll see an antenna there. This is some of the older TVs uh, with reflector, with, with dipoles, etc. The Yagi is a very common antenna. There are loop antennas. And then there's the horn antenna, which I talked about. But the most common antenna that we have is, is the parabolic reflector. And that's how it looks. It's big. You can make big structures like this. And uh, that's what it does. There are a number of properties. I'll talk a little about this a little bit. There's directivity, gain, bandwidth. And then the last one's polarization. I won't talk about that at all in this talk. There's going to be another talk on polarization. And we'll cover some of that in that talk. OK. so. Uh, the primary element that we have is this parabolic reflector. And why choose a parabola? Uh, it's a conic section, and there's a fundamental property that you're using. So typically, we, we have waves that are coming in. So that's this plane wavefront, which is shown by L, Q1, Q2, Q3. And so that's the wavefront that comes and hits this parabola. And these points you know, could be treated as points along the wavefront, which hit the dish surface at various points, P1, P2, and P3. And what happens after reflection is that they all come to this common focus. And so every, object, every, every surface like this, it's called a conic section. All of these have two foci. The parabola has a foci. There's one focus here. And the second focus is, guess where? Where's the second focus? Infinity. It's infinity, right? So you have the plane for your front and infinity. And then you, have, you can pick different surfaces. There are, you know, for a sphere, 
there are two foci and they're both coincidental at the center. Uh, so for, yeah, so you can have, so that's what, that's what this is doing. It's focusing the rays down to this. And this, this point is called the prime focus of the paraboloid. And this is the property that we'll be using for the parabolic reflector. Now, uh, there are different types of mounts and arrangements and the older traditional one was this equatorial bound. In the equatorial bound, you had one of the axes was called the polar axis and obviously it was pointed towards the North Pole. I guess you could point to the South Pole, but that's, that's where it pointed to. And then the other axis was called the declination axis about which the telescope uh, was rotated to point to various declinations. And the simplicity of this arrangement is that all you needed to do if you wanted to track an object was to just rotate it in one axis around the polar axis, and that's what you had to do. And this was very simple before the age of computers and stuff. This was what was the most common thing. But as computation and things improved, telescopes moved from this design, which is a little bit more complex. Uh, well, it's simple, but harder to build to an, uh, a design which is called altitude over alt uh, azimuth or alt as telescopes. So in alt as telescopes, you have two axes, where your azimuth axis, and so your telescope rotates around this axis and then the elevation axis. So at any given point in time, once you know the source coordinates, RA deck, and you know the time and R angle, you can compute what the altitude and azimuth is and just send the telescope there. And that can be done really fast. Now there are different focus arrangements for the telescope. Uh, the, obvious, the, the very first one design that you saw, a simple one where the focus was right here. This is called the prime focus and you can put your feed or your antenna or your horn or whatever you need right in there. The problem with this is that this is a little bit difficult uh, because you can't put big receivers and stuff at the, prime, at the prime focus. You can imagine if you go up and take a look at the SMA, imagine that receiver sitting at the prime focus, <laughs> okay? So that's a little bit more uh, you know, challenging. So instead what we do is we put another reflecting surface here and that's, that's what this is. And this is arrangement is called the Cassegrain. And this is one of the most common arrangements that you're gonna see at most telescopes is this Cassegrain arrangement. And a Cassegrain arrangement, this, this secondary is, is basically a hyperboloid. Again, it's a conical surface. Uh, the, there's, uh, there's two foci of this. Again, one of the, fo the, the, one of the focus is be actually behind this. And then the second focus is right here. And so basically what happens is you have a hole in the center of your dish and then the radiation goes in through here. And so then you put your receiver and stuff out here. So the problem with this arrangement is that, again, as the telescope moves, you have the stuff behind, which is fine, but the whole receiver is also moving in elevation. So as you're moving in elevation, the telescope, the whole receiver is gonna move and it makes it a little bit challenging still to maintain stability, et cetera. And so if you want that, you make, you make a little modification and along the elevation axis, you put like a mirror or something and then you direct the radiation out. <clears throat> and this is called a, a, a nascent mount and you can direct the radiation out and then you can put a little bit more optics out here and I'll show you when you come to the SMA. And what this does is it moves uh, the, the receiver out and you can actually have the receiver to be very stationary with elevation and so it's a little bit more stable. So one of the problems with these two designs is that as you can notice that the, uh, the secondary pretty much is blocking a large part of your, not large, a part of your dish. And so this is the problem. And so if you want maximum sensitivity, there's some losses due to this. And so what you do is you build what's called an offset Cassegrain. And so you, instead of using the whole par par parabola, you use a part of the parabola, and then you have your secondary off to the one side. And then you can have, uh, so there's no blocking in this case. And so you have a little bit more efficiency, but this design has some issues as well. Okay. So we, uh, we talked about the parabola. That's, so that's the primary dish, and this is a very common design. Uh, so you have uh, uh, telescopes that use this pretty much everywhere. So you have the SMA, you have, uh, uh, this is the GMRT. And again, it's a big, big dish. So, so the thing is, it's a simple system, a Cassegrain. The advantage is that the optical axis and the antenna axis will be coincident till in this case. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the antenna beam uh, pattern quantities. We've seen a little bits of this and you have the source which has already been defined. I'm using a little bit different coordinates. So it's new is the frequency, so this intensity and theta five are the directions, but we, Chijo already introduced it. It's just similar to L and M. And so, uh, so this is a, you know, a cartoon model. We'll talk a little bit about, about the beam properties, et cetera. So you have the intensity distribution of the source and then the power received by the antenna is given this formula where A is the area of the antenna. And it, we've taken it as a function of theta and phi, the direction you're looking at. And it, it's a function of frequency as well. Uh, 
So, and then we can compute the beam pattern of this, which is basically the Fourier transform of this aperture. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, uh, formulas buried in the slide, but basically we, we, we have the area, which, and then we can normalize the area and define a quantity of A bar, which is the normalized area. And then we have a beam solid angle, which is an important parameter, which we take the normalized area and then integrate over the solid angle that you're looking at. Uh, one of the things is uh, we want to compare it to what to an isotropic antenna. An isotropic antenna is one which basically radiates uniformly in all directions, and then it's radiating over the, the surface of a sphere, which has an area of four pi. And that's so if you have an isotropic area, that's what you would be radiating in. So we can define then a quantity called directivity, which is related to gain, which is essentially four pi over omega a, where omega a is your beam solid angle. And so therefore, the narrower your beam, uh, the, the higher the directivity or, or the gain that you have. And then the problem also is that the, each antenna, uh, even though you have a, a certain physical surface, there are losses that are associated with this dish, with this surface. And uh, all of these are usually lumped into this quantity called the aperture efficiency eta, which takes into account all the losses. And then we can define another quantity, which is essentially uh, uh, a, the, the actual area times the, the aperture efficiency. And there's a fundamental relationship between all of these quantities, which is just A0 times uh, uh, the, the beam solid angle equals lambda squared. And therefore you can get what the beam solid angle is in terms of area, et cetera. And, this is, uh, and so therefore you can write the directivity like this. And then once you've done this, you notice that as your, as your surface area, as your, as your area increases, the beam solid angle comes down and both the directivity and gain go up. And that's what we're trying to aim for. So we wanna have a dish that's as large and as directive as possible. Okay, so uh, this is again a very quick uh, description of how the antenna radiates. So basically you'll have uh, nearby, what happens is that you have you know, some currents and some fields near the antenna and very near the antenna, what you have is a zone, which is called the near field reactive zone. Typically, obviously that's really, really close to the antenna. And then uh, this, it's not, obviously we don't, you know, none of the uh, objects that you're looking at are in that zone. And typically they're far field and really very far away. And so the far, far away, we have the far field zone, and that's where you have the proper beam pattern that you typically will see, like your Bessel function, et cetera. And then in the intermediate region between the two, we have what's called a Fresnel zone. And again, typically we're not uh, observing in this area, but there are some times when we use things like holography, et cetera, where your transmitter, where you have a beacon, which is nearby, and you're looking at the beam pattern. Uh, uh, you're, look, you're looking at, you're trying to measure the, the antenna. In that case, you need to take into account what, what the Fresnel zone is doing. Uh, we've talked uh, already a fair bit about Fourier transforms and, so, uh, and uh, uh, already, so I won't uh, spend too much time. But basically, you have a circular aperture, and then you can take the Fourier transform, which will, which will get this diffra diffraction pattern, which just looks like this. And there's a cross section through the aperture, and then here's a cross section through the diffraction pattern. And so, pretty much, once you know enough of Fourier transforms, it's very easy to manipulate and understand how the antenna works. Instead of antennas which are circular, you might have a situation where you have a rectangular or a aperture, or, and in that case, uh, Carto has already shown that the Fourier transform of that is a sync function, and so it's easy to, again, understand beam patterns once you know how all of this works. Okay, so here's a blow up of some of the important regions that we, we have, uh, what, the, the important quantities that we need to discuss when we talk about antenna beam patterns. Uh, here's a color picture of what, uh, what the beam pattern looks like. The, more, the most important quantity is this quantity called the half power beam width. So that essentially tells you what the size of your primary main lobe, main lobe is. So the problem is that once you have an antenna, you have radiation going off in all possible directions because as you notice that uh, the, the Fourier transform is not constrained. So it keeps going forever. And so you will have a number of lobes which are called the side lobes. And then ultimately you will also have a region where it's a, there's a back lobe. So some of the radiation doesn't propagate in the forward direction, but some of the radiation will go towards the back as well, which means that your antenna, instead of picking up radiation in the front, is also picking up some of the ground, et cetera. And so there will be some contamination and effects due to that. So that's another important thing to consider. And there are ways of mitigating this, uh, uh, the spillover and other effects. Uh, I talked about the radiation pattern. So again, the radiation pattern uh, is, is a function of the distance from the antenna as well. And so these are all in the far field. The far field is characterized by this quantity 2d squared over lambda. Once your distance exceeds this quantity, that's, that's when you're in the far field. But even in the far field, there are regions where the beam pattern is not fully formed. So ultimately, 
R equals infinity is where typically you're observing your sources from, and that's where you'll have these very well-defined nulls uh, in the beam pattern, and that's what you want. Okay, so coming to the SMA optics, uh, it's a little bit more uh, complicated. Uh, we, we have a modified Cassegrain or, or a Naismith mount. I think the JCMT is also has uh, Naismith mounts, and they can also have primary. So, so, so this sort of design is a very common one if you want to have receivers which, you can, which are off to one side rather than right, sitting right behind the telescope. So we have a number of uh, optical elements in our system. And so we have this mirror M3, which is sitting along the elevation axis. And then you have a number of other mirrors which we actually guide. And the reason we do this is that the SMA actually has a, eight possible receivers that can fit onto the crash diet. So when you go up, you'll take a look that you will have, we have eight possible positions where we can put different receivers. Uh, of that, we have four of them which are already occupied right now. And we can, what we can do is we can pick two, two bands simultaneously and I'll show you how that takes place. And so I'll be talking, uh, most of the stuff that, that's gonna be covered in this talk is pretty much this section. So from where the radiation hits the primary mirror, goes to this mirror, the secondary, and then the tertiary. And then there's a couple more mirrors out here which direct the radiation. So some of it is also, uh, there's a little bit of, there's a, there's a particular mirror or a mesh which actually does the coupling between the LO, because what we do, we'll talk about the receivers in a separate talk in the afternoon uh, by Rob. Uh, and uh, so, that, so we have to actually couple the LO in, in into the receiver as well. And so this is where the top of your, of your receiver or the cryostat is, and that's where the signal goes in. So I'll be just talking about, I've, I've been, I'm only gonna cover whatever is up, hitting up to this point. Okay. So uh, this again shows up a blow up of this, but I wanna show, uh, so what happens here is that, uh, so, the, so the radiation comes from the subreflector, hits this, uh, this mirror, the, the, uh, the M3, M4, and then basically it comes to a focus out here. There's an image basically of the receiver and the horn aperture right at this point. And then we have a few more mirrors that go in and then go through, and then you can actually see a cross section out here. So that this is the cross section from which M6 is coming. And then we have a grid and a, a combiner mirror. What this lets us do is it lets us pick two, uh, two polarizations, two receivers with orthogonal polarizations, and we can observe that simultaneously. And then we have to couple in the LO as well. Uh, and that goes through a, a, a horn, an LO and a horn. And then there's a, uh, there's a mesh here which couples the both the sky radiation, which is coming in through here, and the LO. And then they both go into the mixer. And the mixer will be covered in the talk by Rob in the afternoon. OK. So, uh, so, we, so the SMA has eight such antennas. Uh, it, each antenna is six meters. And the optics is f4, f.4. Uh, the mount is a modified uh, Naismith, and each antenna is actually not a single dish, single surface, but it's comprised of 72 panels, and there are four concentric rings, uh, 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 four concentric rings. And each panel itself is made up of machine cast aluminum. There's a backup structure, and you can see in this case, this was a picture taken uh, well, almost 20 years ago, and you could see everything was empty and th there was no cladding in the backup. And so all these backup structures made up of carbon fiber tubes, and there's heat, uh, heating and other elements to, to de-ice the system, which is probably means uh, the utility company is getting a lot of money. So, <laughs> and then the accuracy of the surface is about 12 microns. Uh, the secondary is also machined aluminum and it actually does chopping. Uh, obviously we don't do chopping when we are doing interferometry, but we can use it to measure single dish parameters and pointing and things like that. There are uh, the array configuration, there are 24 <coughs> pads uh, in the array, and there are four possible configurations, and the configurations range from separations of about nine meters to about 500 meters. And then there are four receivers per antenna, and then we could use two orthogonal <laughs> polarizations simultaneously. Okay, so we talked a little bit about aperture efficiency. Uh, I just mentioned aperture efficiency, but there are a number of quantities that the aperture efficiency uh, can be decomposed into. Uh, uh, the, here's a quantity which is the, which depends on the surface efficiency. So remember, I was talking about uh, about the surface uh, 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 errors in the surface, and that can actually contribute to a degradation in your efficiency. And uh, typically, uh, the the uh, the degradation in sensitivity or the efficiency loss is given by what's called the Ruse formula, and that depends on the RMS surface error errors given by sigma, and uh, so we try to aim, uh, so this is usually the name that you try to get at least 120th, which corresponds to an aperture efficiency, uh, surf, uh, surface error 
uh, aperture efficiency loss of about 67 percent, well, uh, a net aperture efficiency, uh, surface aperture efficiency of 0.67. But actually, our dishes are much better than that, and we have uh, the surface error is actually about 10 microns, which is like uh, a hundredth of it. So it's actually the loss is not that much at uh, 230 gigahertz, uh, and obviously it increases the frequency. Uh, I also mentioned that uh, uh, that uh, our secondary is blocking a little bit, and then there are support legs to for the secondary as well, and that can also cause some amount of loss in uh, due to blockage. And then there's spillover because your beam looks, uh, uh, your beam, everything is not in the main lobe, but a little bit of the power is going off into the side lobes as well. So there's some uh, spillover efficiency. Uh, then there are things like illumination efficiency because, uh, so what you have actually is a horn antenna which is illuminating the surface, the primary surface. But uh, what happens is that you don't want to go, have the illumination go all the way to the edge and provide like a very sharp discontinuity at the edge because that can cause a lot of side lobes. And what you do is you provide like a taper to the illumination by, by designing by your, with, your, with your horn. You can design the horn so that it, uh, the, there's a taper that goes all the way to the edge and you don't illuminate the edge at, at 100%. So there are some losses due to this and that minimizes side lobes but then causes a little bit of loss. And I think that's like 87% or something like that. So the net, uh, uh, net aperture efficiency in the ideal case uh, for the SMA should probably be around like 80% or something at 230 gigahertz, around 80, 85% if you, can, if you get everything else right. But then uh, it's, a, it's a function of frequency. And then there are obviously other things like alignment itself, which uh, it, it's absorbed in, in the mis miscellaneous terms as usual, but that can actually be significant. And we need to measure all of those as well. Okay, so the surface uh, accuracy is an important uh, aspect and we need to measure that very well. And uh, we use a holography system. Uh, and there's basically what, ha there is a beacon which is sitting uh, uh, or a transmitter in this case. So this is one case where we are actually transmitting nearby, but there's a, there's a beacon which sits on the Subaru telescope and that sends a signal which, uh, uh, there's a comb of frequencies and we can use that with two of our antennas. One of our antennas kept stationary and it's a reference antenna. And the other antenna is scanning. And we can actually measure this, uh, uh, this, uh, the amplitude and phase difference between the two. And that we can use that to, to determine two quantities. We can use that to determine the illumination, the surface illumination. That's an important quantity. And we can also use it to determine the surface errors. And uh, as I mentioned, when you first put the dish uh, together, the panels, even though each individual panel is really good, when you put the panels together, there will be some mismatches, and that can cause a net uh, surface uh, uh, error. And so that, that's what this, uh, this, this, uh, this diagram shows. And so the RMS in this case was about 65 microns. And so we can go ahead and try to adjust all of these panels. So when you go to the SMA building at the front, you will see one of the panels. And so we can adjust these panels and down to an, uh, uh, to, to an, uh, to an RMS surface accuracy of about 12 microns, which is quite good, which means that we, our losses are very minimal. And uh, uh, this is, uh, is very stable. We can measure the go ahead and measure the surface after even a few years, uh, four years time, and it hasn't, it doesn't change by much. And we have to do this often, maybe I think every three or four years, we go around and try to measure, use holography to measure the disk surface. So the other thing that's important is pointing. Uh, you wanna know where your dish is pointed because you wanna have all your dishes pointed in the same direction, otherwise there's no interferometry. And so you want to point to everything. And so there, there are a number of contributions. Uh, so obviously uh, the SMA is, move, is, is a reconfigurable array. So you take the antennas and you move it from one pad to the other. Typically we do it every couple months. And so uh, when we do this and we take the antenna and put it on another pad, uh, you don't have very good control. You, you have reasonable control and you can put it, but there will be some errors which we have to determine. Typ uh, most of these errors are, uh, I mean, the common error you can imagine is that all the pads are not level. So there is some tilt. So all the different pads will have some different tilt. So we need to measure that tilt. Uh, then also when you take an antenna and you put it on a pad, you're not gonna be able to get it exactly right. So there might be some, some movement in azimuth. So there will be an azimuth error. And so we have a number of these, these are all the typical terms. And even there might be some small elevation because again, they, they may not be all level. So we have to measure all of these quantities. And it typically takes us you know, a couple of hours and so what we do is we, uh, we have actually uh, optical uh, cameras in, e in each telescope and we can use that. We, we can also use a radio model to, to obtain the all sky. It's typically we need about hundred measurements 
So I showed you there are about 10 terms in the previous uh, equation that we need to solve for, but actually there are a little bit more because there are some nonlinearities and some of them might be some second order terms. So typically we have, I think about uh, like 19 terms that we, uh, so we have a 19 term model and we can use that to solve for, uh, uh, we, can, we need about hundred measurements, all sky, and that's what we do. So this is a sample of the radio pointing model. So uh, typically it takes about a couple of hours. And so uh, we can, uh, we look at a number of uh, typically point sources throughout the sky and we can determine, so this is the, the coverage in uh, azimuth around here and elevation. And then uh, we can fit, uh, these, and these show the residuals after the pointing model has been determined. And then these are some of the vari variations that you have uh, before the model was corrected. And then basically uh, the RMS residuals are quite good. And the net RMS is about a couple of arc seconds. So the pointing is, once the model is determined, we know the pointing to within a couple of arc seconds. Okay, so I'm gonna, this is my last slide. So uh, most of the time you don't really care as when you get your data, you get your data, uh, but there are some things that affect your data. Obviously the biggest thing that, uh, that uh, as someone who gets their data matters is the primary beam uh, correction. So if you have an extended source, you need to, uh, when you, if you need to know the flux accurately and you need to, uh, the amplitude accurately, you need to know what the primary beam correction is. Again, that will probably be, that is provided to you, but uh, mainly depends on the dish. And then there, there are things that affect your data. If your illumination is not good and your amplitude, uh, and there are phase and amplitude errors, then that will cause uh, some degradation, some signal decorrelation. If there are effects from spillover, you're looking at the ground, et cetera, that can lead to higher system temperatures. Uh, if your pointing is not good, then you will have some loss in sensitivity. Uh, then obviously, there's, ultimately there's antenna polarization. Uh, I'll, there will be a separate talk and uh, that's it. So I have a list of references in the end. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, Can you go back to your slide that showed the primary lobes and the side lobes and kind of the spillover from the back? I just, I'm a little far away. I couldn't tell what the, you can see the color scale, but I couldn't actually read what the scale was. Oh. Uh, I just was curious. Okay, uh, so, wait, I mean, when, I mean this, is, this is a cross section. Yeah, this, yeah. I just so, can't read the bar. Uh, I think this is in linear scale, so it can be quite high. Mm -hmm. So this is in linear scale and you can see, I'm uh, sorry about the thing, it's a little bit cut off. But typically they're quite, uh, I mean, typically we measure it in dB scale. DB scale. So the, the primary beam is about, usually I think like 30 dB or more. Got it. DBI. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so a, a spherical aperture has a, a focal line. Yes. If I remember correctly, so yes. is there an advantage or disadvantage to making an interferometer out of spherical antennas? I don't, I'd have to think about it, but I think typically uh, you don't, yeah, I think, I have to think about. So I can throw something in there because I do know, not a spherical, but a cylindrical. Yeah, cylindrical, yeah. So there, yeah. And one thing that's that's an incredible pain in the butt is that uh, if you have a lot of feeds that are sitting right next to one another, they like to talk to one another. So they will couple, and it turns out that the coupling between different things looks exactly like the sky signal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it, it can cause some nightmares. Yeah. Or it has caused some nightmares for people who have these types of effects. I mean, the thing about primary, uh, of, with, uh, with uh, Zarabola, their primary feeds in other telescopes, I, I think the VLA may have an option, I think, of a primary or... Uh, but there are like telescopes like uh, the SK prototype and stuff which have uh, focal plane arrays. And so there are some advantages when you use a primary feed system. But again, that, those are with uh, regular parabolic mirrors. All right, so I think it's time for lunch. Let's thank Ron one more time.